Hello, and thank you for joining us. Today we're going to go over what we believe to be the key to scaling cloud computing. And that's really being able to create a user-centric, business-relevant cloud. Now that's quite unique in the industry today, and Dynamic Ops is the only technology that provides this for your environment. My name is Chad Jones. I'm Vice President Strategy and Product Management for Dynamic Ops. We've got a lot to show you today, so let's get to it. So today, we're going to review the context conundrum, the ability to actually apply settings and configurations to your particular business environment. We're going to introduce you to the Dynamic Ops user-centric business-relevant cloud and show you through demonstration how this applies to your environment and can really scale the cloud to meet your needs. So if we step back for a second and we look at the cloud deployment challenge, first of all, shared infrastructure is really the key to achieving cloud economies of scale. Most companies and analysts unfortunately tell you that you must homogenize your environment, throw out your existing processes and systems and homogenize around this new cloud vision. Unfortunately, there's a lot of sunk cost that's inside of those systems and process. You want to be able to re-leverage that. But with that line of thinking, you've got to be narrowing your focus and use cases so that you only have a, solve a particular need. Now, really, if I'm going to have a broad-based solution, that's not going to cut it. So really, least common denominator solutions achieve poor adoption because they don't really meet the unique needs of each group. Now, why is that? So if we look at virtual management today, virtual management tools are great at creating, managing, tracking, and reporting on your virtual assets. You know, and there are all sorts of fabric management tools that are doing this today. But now, cloud comes into the picture. and says, okay, we're gonna add self-service to your environment. But that really introduces a standardized, least common denominator service offering, a global approach for policy and systems to try and solve your use case needs. The reality is that business units have all sorts of different requirements, silos of IT, different systems, different regulations, and the list goes on and on. That operational context for how you apply that policy in the context of the business to your systems is the key to scaling the cloud. Beyond that, you've got to be able to have a personalization, a user-centric capability to make sure that you don't have any one-offs that fall out of the process. We find that 40% of all requests that come in fall out of the automated process into a manual operation. That's really not going to meet the needs of your business. So you've got to be able to have a user-specific configuration that can calculate exactly what that unit of one needs and therefore keep everything in the end-to-end -end automated system. So context is key for cloud management and scaling the cloud. So if we look a little bit deeper into an example requirement that we'll play into our demo later on, for an operational context, let's say that I have developer, QA, UAT, or user acceptance testing groups, production, and data entry. Now, they all have different needs. Now, the business need across those groups for the first three might be speed. Right? I need to get those VMs up and running very quickly. But when I go to production, I need to make sure that I have compliance and security patches and fixes and all of those things. And then when I do the data entry groups, I might need something like a desktop to be actually perform the interaction with that application. Well, when I think about just provisioning methods alone, cloning is really going to satisfy the speed need inside of the business. But when I go to production, uh, a more encompassing system like Microsoft System Center Configuration Manager is really what is needed. And then when I look at going to desktops, using link clones to save on disk space and tie in with Citrix Zen Desktop is key to enabling that system. Beyond that, having different resources that are required for particular users is also key to the system, as well as what about locations? So in any other system, you end up having an exponential table of service catalog entries that you have to create and moreover, have to actually assign and worry about the ongoing management of that assignment over time. It becomes a very untenable management problem. But Dynamic Ops handles this very differently. So we create a user-centric, business-relevant cloud 
through a set of policies that give you a granular level of control. The first is that we create a cloud blueprint. The cloud blueprint adds in security and policies, machine templates, SLAs, cost profiling, service tiers, and many other components that actually define how that service will operate. We then assign that to reservations that will tell you where you can actually apply that blueprint because fabric placement is important, and then assign that to a group of users that makes up a business unit. Now, inside of their, in our dev test UAT example, they may have request, provision, management, and retire, but that policy also ties into a set of tools to execute that policy. So again, here, platform tools, enterprise tools, space efficient tools, really anything you want to pull into that tool set is possible. So in our example, we wanted to do cloning. So we can pull in hypervisor cloning, no problem. But when I go into the next level, I can actually personalize the service. Everything inside of the system is wrapped in metadata. Now the metadata can be manipulated through three very important methods inside of what we call custom properties. The first is a static custom property. I can statically define what a setting is for any of those properties. Or I can prompt the user to fill in information for those properties. But most importantly and unique to Dynamic Ops, we can actually kick off a workflow that will dynamically calculate what that setting should be based upon any system interaction. Active Directory, PeopleSoft, uh, a CMDB, the list goes on and on. So from there, I can actually go out and only have one service catalog entry that encompasses all of the policy necessary and any of the subtle differences that would normally cause me to have multiple service catalog entries goes away. I have one service catalog entry that can apply to multiple groups because we can dynamically calculate what that group needs. So now we can simply add in our next set of policies and systems around production and that can be very different than our desktop groups as well. And all of those coexist side by side inside of the same instance of Dynamic Ops. So inside of our demonstration today, we're going to take you along a scenario of creating an HR application. So development is actually located in New York City. QA is in India. User acceptance testing is in Boston. Production could be in New York City, LA, or Boston. And data entry is actually in Boston as well. So we're going to show you through the location property how we dynamically calculate where that proper location should be. The key capabilities to view here are, first of all, the multi-tenant policy that utilizes specific tools and approval policies to make it exactly applicable to that business unit. Also, dynamic, static, and prompted calculation of properties will be shown as well. And then really that results in a simplified and broadly applicable blueprint that defines exactly what that service will be. So let's go ahead and switch over to our demo and take a look. So here we are inside of the demonstration portal. I'm logged in as my administrator, as you can see. Now I'm going to go over into my enterprise administrator context and into my global blueprints. Now, what you're going to see here are three blueprints. This defines the base so that I can begin creating my HR application inside of development. So if I go in and edit the properties here, what you're going to see is that I have my name of my blueprint, and then I have which groups this blueprint applies to, which one can actually use it. So I have development, QA, and UAT that can use it. Go down, machine prefix, what my approval policy is, which is just the default approval policy here. Costs, my archive time and days. If I go over to my build information, you can see that I'm actually going to use cloning to build my system. Now I have my CPUs, what's my memory, reserve storage, and my lease days as well. Now what's really interesting here is first of all it's on vSphere and it is using cloning. That's the set of tools it's going to use. But if I move into properties, you'll see that I have this location property because location is important for where this virtual machine needs to live. So I'll click in and look at my build pro uh, properties and what we'll see here is this drop down location. Now, it says it's going to prompt the user, but right now this value is empty. What we have done on the back end through something called our data dictionary is created a workflow that will go out to Active Directory and look at what group you're a member of 
apply business logic to that membership, and then auto-populate the fields inside of that blueprint at the point of provisioning so that it will go to the right location based upon who you are and what group you're a member of. So I'll go ahead and close this. And then if we go over and look back at our blueprints, that's really assigned to the people that are relevant for that base system. So that would be QA development and user acceptance testing. Now if I go down to prod and say edit, you'll notice here that there's a slightly different set of configurations. First of all, it's only assigned to my production apps group. And then as I go through and I look at the build information, uh, it's actually using v vSphere server create and I'm using SCCM to actually do the provisioning here. So this will actually kick off a task sequence inside of SCCM, do the operating system deployment to the virtual container, and then lay down the application. I then go into properties, and I go back and look at location properties, and you'll notice again that the same drop-down location custom property exists. Now again, we'll go in and based on the membership of this user, populate that value with the proper locations. And hit cancel here. And then I'll move over to our last blueprint, which is the data entry blueprint. Now, the application in its end state will actually be a desktop application. And so we need to be able to create virtual desktops in this situation to have our data entry group go in and log in and execute the application and interact with it. So here we have just our desktop group that gets access to that application. If I go into build information, you can see that actually I'm cloning this one off of the Win7 template here. So when we come in here, you'll notice that I'm using linked clone. That's the type of cloning workflow that we have. That's a space efficient workflow to interact for desktops with Zen Desktop. So now when I go into properties, I have that same location property. And again, it's the exact same drop down location that will be dynamically calculated across all of these blueprints. So now let's go ahead and see what that looks like as an end user. So I'll go ahead and open up another portal instance here and I'm going to go in as my dev user. Now my dev user, this is the actual self-service portal. You can see he's the dev user. I'm going to go into my blueprints and what you're going to see here are two blueprints that have been assigned to him. Now this is the one that I am concerned with here that's around my HR application. And I'll go ahead and create a new machine. So now what you're going to see is all of the things that came up in that blueprint, all from that same policy. I'm going to go into additional settings. I'm going to say my location. Here's NYC. It's the only choice inside of that dropdown. Now what has happened on the background is we went out to Active Directory, looked at the group, dynamically calculated that that's what they get. That's the location by default is NYC. Now, if there were multiple locations that were applicable based on the business logic, it would drop several of those down. Now, we'll see that a little bit later. But since this is the only one where you would actually have that development resource reside, it only gave you one choice. There are other options that would be not to not even display this in a dropdown, just allow it to you know, populate to NYC automatically and the user would never know. So then I can go ahead and say submit. Now, if I go over to my QA user, you'll see that the QA is going to see something that is pretty much the same. They're going to go in and they're going to see this same blueprint. Now, when they click on this application and they go to additional settings, they're going to have their location drop down. And inside of that location drop down, you see Bangalore. Again, they're in India. So you want to be able to have those resources closest to them. So this will provision based on the Bangalore data center. Now from there, I'm going to go ahead and log in as my UAT user. And actually UAT is sitting closest to the users in Boston. So they exist in Boston. When they go into the blueprint and click on the blueprint, and again go to additional settings, what they're going to find is that Boston is the choice for them. Again, the only choice for them. And this is again dynamically calculated based upon the membership in their group. Now from there, we open up the prod manager. This is a little bit different. The production manager has choices on where they want the application to actually reside. Now there's multiple data centers inside of this host company. So if we go in and select onto the production image. Remember, that's going to use SCCM based on our policy. 
We look at additional settings and I hit the drop down. There's three choices here. Now there can be user sets all over the organization. You know, they want to make sure that they're actually putting the production closest to wherever those users are. So in this case, actually the uh, data entry users are located in Boston, so they select Boston. Again, dynamically calculated for that user. And now once I say submit, this is actually going to go to the Boston Data Center. So then finally, when I go into my users, and I actually select my data entry user, and this is where we set up the desktops using Citrix Zen Desktop and the Link clones, when they log in, they're going to see their option for the virtual desktop. Go ahead and click on that. And when they go down to, and again, their own properties based upon their blueprints, but when I go down to additional settings and I click on location, Boston's their only location. Again, they're users that are in Boston for this data entry application. That's the only location that they should get. So again, what we've done here is actually shown that through very simple, very few set of blueprints, we've been able to dynamically calculate properties where with any other competitive system out there, you would have several service catalog entries and then have to manage where those would be. We're able to simply dynamically calculate those and make them applicable to how the business is, not only from a location and property standpoint, but from a tool standpoint, utilizing whether it's cloning, linked cloning, Zen Desktop, System Center Configuration Management, or any tool set that you need that's applicable for your environment. So as you can see through the demonstration, Dynamic Ops delivers an enterprise class cloud computing infrastructure in the shortest amount of time at the lowest cost. Really, the context is the key to driving cloud scale and applicability to your business. And Dynamic Ops is the only company to bring this technology to you. It has comprehensive out-of-the-box functionality, user-centric business-aware governance, it's extensible by design, it has a holistic approach between private and public, virtual and physical servers and desktops, it's multi-vendor, open and agnostic, and has the most production deployments over 5,000, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 VMs under management. Dynamic Ops is the key to building your user-centric business-relevant cloud and meeting your cloud goals today. My name is Chad Jones, and we look forward to seeing you in the future.